please, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure that you have called me over here. So I would share my screen and if you can see me and you can hear me, then kindly let me know. So has my screen been shared? Yes, sir, we can see your screen. All right. So I would once again like to thank everybody for inviting a novice like me. And uh, I would talk about the medical physics program at PIAS that we have been running since 2001 and uh, another proposal of medical physics residency at Pakistan. So I am the program coordinator here for the medical physics program at the Department of Physics and Applied Mathematics. Uh, this is a brief uh, presentation layout, uh, a few typical things that we would be discussing. So, uh, I mean, everybody knows who is a medical physicist, but I just wanted to highlight this uh, definition of double APM, and you must have seen this before, that who is a qualified medical physicist. So it says that he or she is an individual uh, who can independently provide clinical professional services in the following thematic areas, which is radiotherapy, radiology, nuclear medicine, radiation protection. And uh, recently they have added, not very recently, but the definition update has now included MRI physics as well. So this is something, uh, I mean, everybody knows it, just to repeat it. And this is the medical physics career roadmap that at least we should have an MS degree in medical physics, uh, then clinical residency should be there in one of these subspecialities. And then uh, somebody can be called clinically qualified medical physicist. I'm talking about the most straightforward uh, career roadmap. I'm not talking about other lateral entries or alternate pathways, which are always available there. You can come from PhD and you can come from other disciplines as well. Uh, but this is the most straightforward one. Okay, these are some of the uh, statistics which we have collected over the last few years once we were doing this, uh, uh, preparing a proposal for the residency program. And in this uh, data collection, which is all, I mean, it is a crude data, it is not a refined data. And we have uh, statistically not uh, analyzed it so far. So, uh, the, this is, is uh, something if, which we got from the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission as a major cancer stakeholder and also from uh, PNRA as well. So uh, these were some of the stats that we have collected uh, as part of a study panel. And uh, these numbers would come once again as well. So the cancer incidence increase, you know it. Similarly, the number of patients increase and uh, private sector, some data that was provided by PNRA. In general, in PAC hospitals, 14 to 15% increase in uh, PAC as well. Uh, so at PAC level, there were some uh, up upgrades and some of them have already been, I mean, carried out. Uh, a lot of uh, new linear accelerators have been there, cyber knives, PETs, MRI, SIM, um, Helicyan, and things like that. So a number of things they were uh, coming up and the diagnostic equipment at the same time, nuclear medicine equipment. The same is the case with the private sector hospital at that time. What were the practiced uh, uh, modalities? So these were some of the modalities. Still, we have some cobalt-60 based units available, but 3D CRT, IMRT, uh, these are now common. And uh, SRS and SBRT are also now introduced. And in future, they were planning gallium-67 imaging, interstitial beak brachytherapy, iodine-125 for interstitial needle implants for prostate and things like that. So this data is a little bit old, but this was the direction that when we conducted this national study, uh, that's where the things were heading. And some of these things have been implemented and some of these things are in pipeline. 
now i will come to the uh, after this brief discussion i will come to the medical physics education and training status in pakistan uh, i see it as a four part evolution uh, the first stage was that there were graduates in physics and chemistry and then they had the on the job training uh, mr dr faiz khan one of the legendary uh, physicist from pakistan was of this category that he did a physics degree master's degree and then he was trained and then he went abroad the second category or the second phase or the second step ahead was one year post graduate diploma in medical and health physics and this was offered at the predecessor of pias that was called center for nuclear studies and those people went into atomic energy hospitals uh then the third stage came when in 2001 this ms in medical physics program was launched and uh, on the job clinical training under physicists were carried out and now we are planning or we are trying to enter the final or fourth stage uh, whereby graduates in physics or any other science or engineering can come they can do a masters in medical physics and then they can have a two year clinical residency structured program so with this background i come to the masters in medical physics program at pias this is a unique program that it was initiated on the advice of international atomic energy agency iaea actually asked pias to start this program and there was a tc project that is called a technical cooperation project that is called that was called initiation of master of science uh, medical physics degree program under this under this project what happened under this project what happened was that uh, ie experts uh, developed the curriculum they trained the faculty some fellowships were offered and also a medical physics lab was established and uh, it is a unique kind of an ms program uh, aga khan university has a diploma or traineeship program as well in addition some physics departments they have a course or two about medical physics or they offer some research in medical physics for example at bahawalpur islamia uh, university so uh, with this uh, uh, medical physics program what you can see is that full fledged cancer hospitals directly run by provincial governments are still not there but now uh, the kpk government since last 2 3 4 years they are offering a fellowship in ms and phd medical physics and we have already a graduate of this program who's uh, serving in shifa international hospital and this year they have provided three scholarships for the program so this is i think a very important development that provincial governments should come up and sponsor students for medical physics education Uh, so that they can be then placed at the division district and tertiary level uh, healthcare facilities uh this is the current course outline now the minimum degree requirements for a two year degree program of five semesters is 37 credit hours when we started this program in 2001 it was very course intensive uh, because that's how pias operates it was a 75 credit hours program and uh, there were at least 15 courses in the first three semesters and there was also a zero semester but that in line with the hcc regulations from time to time uh, this course has been cut down in credit hours although the duration is the same the core is based of radiation biology radiology radiotherapy and nuclear medicine then there are some in uh, compulsory courses and you can see that computing applied mathematics radiation interaction and detection and then protection clinical dosimetric laboratories so they form a core in pias as well we have optional courses as well from time to time special topics in medical physics are offered then thesis project and then on the job training so usually this fourth and fifth semester thesis project and on the job training is mostly carried out in the hospitals so i mean they they have an exposure even during the ms program of 7 to 8 months in a hospital in general 
these are some of the centers where uh, the thesis projects and trainings have uh, have been taking place uh, this is our output so recently to cross the 200 mark when our 19th batch passed out and now we have 207 graduates and you can see a majority of them have gone to cancer hospitals then there are other radiation facilities uh, here, such as, or it can be academia where they have been working. A sizable portion has gone to Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority because Pakistan Nuclear Regulatory Authority requires medical physicists to regulate the uh, radiation medicine services. And then we have people serving in the private sector as well, for example, cancer care, uh, Shifa. And recently, we have two international graduates from Iraq who have uh, just graduated. So this is the wholesome picture. And you can appreciate that besides these 111, the remainder of the half are doing other very specialized jobs uh, uh, where radiations and humans and protection and all these things are available. Because if you look into the course contents of the course titles on the last slides, a solid foundation in radiation biology, anatomy, interaction, protection, uh, gives you a lot of leverage. Uh, this was that medical physics laboratory equipment that was donated by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, this rand of phantom, we have been carrying it or this is for doing research. Uh, this is the only PIAS program which has been uh, vetted by an IE expert mission. The gentleman that you can see in the left panel is Dr. Andrew Fielding. Uh, he's from Queensland University of Technology, one of the IE experts. And he came in 2013 to review this whole course. And this was his uh, uh, impression that if we compare this uh, uh, with the Australian ACPSCM, the coursework, it is uh, quite in comparison with that. And uh, there was a plan, and there's still a plan, that international students should come from international atomic energy agencies and other funding agencies, and they should join over here for the MS program. And that's why I recently you saw two Iraqi students over here. Uh, in this, uh, two things are there. The top left panel is Rector Piaz with the two graduating students who have just left a few days before. They were from Ministry of Health employees from Iraq, and they came over here. They were provided full fee waiver by Piaz, and they graduated. And Alhamdulillah, they performed very well. The lower left bottom is a tweet from the IEA current chief, uh, Rafael Mariano Grossi. And IEA has a program that is called Marie Curie Fellowship. Marie Curie, yeah. Mary Sklodowska Curie Fellowship Program. Each year on September 10th, is, uh, uh, its applications are closed and it's only for females. So at PIAS, uh, PIAS is hosting uh, Marie Curie scholars in medical physics program as well. And two, three days ago, the female students in the right panel, they graduated from the IEA Marie Curie Fellowship Program. This is a very prestigious international award that is hosted at PIAS in Pakistan. And uh, most likely these students will be offered internships abroad as well. All right, so about this MS program, this, I mean, there are some funny observations that uh, I should share with you. Uh, once we are in an MS program, we see the uh, expertise and the fluence with which those colleagues who are working in the hospital, they operate. But at the same time, probably what we miss is that there's a very solid theoretical foundation. And uh, that is the core of this uh, the practical skill. You can have practical skill even without solid theoretical foundation. So basically our mandate is a master's program and it's not a clinical training program. This is the bottom line. So we have to keep a balance between theoretical needs and uh, practical uh, aspects of the, of the program. For example, as you can see on PAS website, the detailed curriculum, we have a very strong mathematical foundations uh, to be delivered to the student because 
for example if you are doing ct reconstruction and i don't know radon trans transform how would i do if i don't don't know basic physics and mathematics how will we construct the mri image uh, and things like that so uh, i mean uh, it is the intent or it is the desire that okay the practical sessions would be there labs would be there hospital visits would be there but essentially we are not replacing a, a clinical residency program so the second thing is that we pay a lot of attention on the thesis writing and technical writing skills because what we tell the graduate that it's the skill that you have learned but it's the document that you have prove uh, uh, produce that will be basically your cv in the future and this is something i have i have been examining thesis from around the country this is something where we are nationally lacking so a lot of emphasis in the fourth and fifth semester is put on this thing this is something which is a shortcoming uh, then these courses are quite applied in nature and we have to regularly update and introduce new topics for the sake of discussion a few years ago in mammography there was no mention of digital breast tomosynthesis now we have to mention it and uh, hybrid imaging and new developments in radiation biology things like that so there's a proper there should be a proper mechanism which is in place in pias that how frequently the courses should be revised for example so far since the inception in the last 20 21 years five revisions five major course revisions have been uh, carried out and the intent is to provide them uh, best of the best content uh, the most recent uh, literature the relevant research papers the relevant uh, icru reports double apm reports uh, relevant uh, video le uh, lectures or tutorials or skill set development so this is something which is i think very important with a masters program i can share here with you that i went to malaysia and i it was an honor to listen to professor yon sunjins from mcgill university and one of the course he was talking about i would not mention the course and he said that this particular course in the medical physics curriculum took us 10 years to get it to this stage uh, where it is now so there is a, a life cycle of an academic program and a, a, and a academic course so this is i think a very important take away we cannot just put our stuff there and teach it to students the other thing is that uh, we want to produce clinical scientists not glorified technicians so there should be clinical scientists they should be able to analyze the data they should be able to handle the data they should be able to extract and infer from the data as well this is a skill which goes beyond medical physics because medical physicists are facing a lot of challenges in the field as, as well some of them i would talk about for example you must have seen this point counterpoint uh, artificial intelligence will soon change the landscape of medical physics research and practice radiologist will be replaced by an algorithm um, ra uh, radiotherapy professional doctor oncologist contouring will be done by the computer whether this happens how fast this happens but there is a sea of information and sea of changes that are coming and uh, probably at times machines are taking our jobs in some areas automation is there and there are many things happening so to stay relevant we need to have a solid foundation as a clinical scientist and not as a machine operator or a qc doer that is important i am not belittling that but from a academic perspective this solid foundation can propel you in any new upcoming direction for example if i have good mathematics i have good statistics i have good communication skills i can embrace data sciences and and move on another one just look at this mba degree is needed for leadership roles in medical fields so things like these are coming and you know about this particular document as well redefining and reinvigorating the role of physics in clinical medicine a few years ago in hobart there was a conference where a lot of things were shared what are the new keywords what are the new buzzwords uh, which particular sub areas of medical physics will be overrun by this new it ai deep learning revolution and things like that so uh, 
for example in computing in medical physics course we used to teach monte carlo methods we are still teaching monte carlo methods but we have introduced uh, an introduction to deep learning ai and similar technologies and their use in medical physics so at least someone going into this area or radiomics for example can have an initial idea of what's happening okay uh we have uh, previously the department was offering a physics phd in which people used to do uh, research in medical physics since 2015 a uh, dedicated uh, phd medical physics program has been launched and uh, two students have completed one in small field dosimetry and one in luminescence dosimetry dr athia has done her phd in small field dosimetry and uh, the other student dr sekandar has done in luminescence dosimetry and these are some of the areas of research that we are doing another thing i want to mention is that the ms graduates those 207 ms graduates that you saw over there uh, a large number of them have went abroad they have secured scholarship in top notch universities across the globe australia uk new zealand germany uh, north america uh, korea uh, and then they have come back so uh, i mean the ms degree holders and some of them have come uh, to us for a phd program so this is something which has started and it is quite good it's quite intensive these are some of the recent publications of last one and half year and you can see that most of them are in good isi index journals uh, most of them are from luminescence dosimetry then some monte carlo simulations and a uh, small field dosimetry so this uh, this is the recent snapshot of the isi index publications of the uh, phd medical physics program i wanted to say about phd medical physics because it has really stood on top of the ms medical physics program so it is one of the logical outcomes of this program all right we have been uh, actively participating in the medical physics education uh, and training so there's an and additional and sorry for that we have provided expert missions we are national project coordinators of different capacity building uh, some of the ia projects such as ras 6088 was conceived at pyas uh, there's another ia national health integrated project in which we have participated so we have uh, quite a bit of uh, international footprint and uh, these uh, connections uh, really help us uh, in uh, not only propagating the name of the country of the institute but also uh, placement of our phd students in different research labs for 6 months and uh, potential examiners from abroad so uh, i don't have time over here otherwise i would have shown you that we have called in people from america we have called in people from japan so uh, belgium uh, ghent university we have a connection with them wulongong university australia Uh, qut of course and uh, other places in the scandinavia because these phd students that i was talking about they have been to other places for 6 months on hcc uh, sponsorship just to detract little bit do medical physicists have a role in case of nuclear radiological emergency this was a question and uh, in in this backdrop argan national university and and japanese institutes have been carrying out uh, quite uh, impressive trainings so what why i have shown it over here this and the next slide uh, the reason for that is that pas medical physics workforce is already trained in these things uh, by virtue of our association with ionizing radiations and the excellent detection and protection facilities and culture that we have over here so they are quite well trained in these things i think this is something which is over and above usually medical physicists are not trained in such sort of uh, disciplines now i would come to the residency part uh this iea expert mission of 2013 it actually suggested that pakistan should start a, uh, i mean the residency program you can see tcs 37 these are iea technical uh course series where uh training course series sorry where basically 
uh, the requirements are given and all how to set up a residency program. So Dr. Andrew Fielding suggested this. Actually, we don't have, unfortunately, a professional body which is truly independent financially and administratively, like Australia, like AAPM and things like that. So uh, this is what we are trying to now do. So what would be the benefit of uh, this? Uh, local training of medical physicists will become structured. Uh, this major radiotherapy and other infrastructure transition will be facilitated. Workforce will be uh, available in terms of uh, residents. And also to PIAS and to other participating institutes and hospitals, increased resources from international community can be made available. So residency is something which is natural to come in Pakistan, and it is our natural need. It will be a value addition. Uh, and it will also harmonize the uh, training deficiency across the country. Now, the IEA suggests that there should be, this is how the residency structure should look like. In each country, there should be a national responsible authority, uh, which will create a national steering committee, and then there will be a national program coordinator. So national responsible authority is the highest authority, then steering committee, day-to-day -day affairs, and a program coordinator uh, who will look after the residents. So national responsible authority, the IEA says that uh, it could be medical physics professional body, that's the most preferred one. It could be a regulatory or licensing body, atomic energy authority, ministries, so uh, this is the legal basis of the residency. Starting a residency program is very easy, but who will issue the certificate? What would be its legal status in the country? That, these are important things, and that's why we have over the last four, more than five, six years, we have worked on this proposal to reach, uh, to take it to a certain climax, which I will describe. Uh, so these are the examples of the NRAs, National Responsible Authorities in various countries. Okay, so Thailand has a very long phys physics body. Uh, Dr. Anchali is over there. Australia has a college. And then you can see in different countries, the situation is different according to the local conditions. It is not necessary that it should be a professional body, but some body should be there designated by the government to, to, to look after it. Then National Steering Committee, this is like the working arm. It will have uh, professionals, a working medical physicist, uh, representation of all stakeholders, uh, what modules should be offered, how the IEA competency guides in different radiotherapy, radiology, and nuclear medicine should be adopted to the local conditions, what revisions should be made. All these sort of decisions will be made by the National Steering Committee. Uh, these are the compositions from the region of the National Steering Committee, and you can see it has representation from different stakeholders in the country. But once a uh, national responsible authority is created, then National Steering Committee uh, will look after the residency program. And finally, we need to have a program coordinator who will basically do all day-to-day -day secretariat work, talking to the, uh, I mean, trainees, residents, and talking to the clinical supervisors, maybe managing an online system like Ample, tracking the uh, progress and things like that. So to summarize, uh, one way to start residency is to declare these three things, to, to, to basically initiate these three steps, the topmost one, the second one, and the third one. All right, I, I have, now I'm coming to Pakistan. Uh, the, f the first few slides, I had some scattered data. I have put this again into one panel. And again, I must say that these numbers are just rough numbers. To just give you a ballpark idea what is happening in the country, we did some data collection. And from the private sector, actually, PNRA was involved, and the data was given by PNRA. Uh, so it is just to show you that uh, how the landscape is. And since 2017, I know it has changed. Uh, so for Pakistan, what is the proposal is that we should have a medical physics certification board, which will be our NRA. Then we will have a national steering committee and national program coordinator. I'm not going into the details or the uh, composition of this, but at this moment, but what I can say is that for the medical physics certification board, Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission will take the lead and PNRA will be in support. So all these deliberations, PNRA has been taken on board 
and in principle pnra and pac has agreed that for the whole country a medical physics residency program should be launched and in which a due share to the private sector colleagues will be given in the upper bodies upper two bodies as well so we will have uh, once that uh, thing starts rolling so then we will share those details and the first now right now the medical physics certification board initiation process has been initiated but as you can appreciate it will have vcs it will have very high level people so it is taking some time and then it will have a legal backing as well atomic energy has an ordinance uh, pnra has an ordinance so uh, once uh, in near future when whenever this residency is launched uh, so the certificate will have a legal backing otherwise like ies sponsored uh, uh, residency programs or training programs structured clinical training programs have been started in the region under ras 6077 6087 these projects but unless and until they are not recognized by the country it's a piece of experience certificate that we are carrying so on a scale of 0 to 10 over these last 7 8 10 years uh, that's how far we have i mean traveled so uh, because uh, making an agreement on uh, initiation of such a big task which has legal ramification as well is quite difficult so to summarize this is some sort of a, uh, a mind map that we have rising cancer burden we have national radiation regulator we have cancer hospitals we have ectemia we have residency we have e learning resources uh, and th- many different things are coming into play and the ultimate i think the ultimate aim of all this should be that radiation medicine services should improve day by day we should be able to identify the challenges that are upcoming and our academic side our clinical training side uh, should be cognizant of what is happening on the ground because there are some some ideas which are very fancy but for a patient load like pakistan uh wishing them is good but practically achieving them at time becomes very difficult so to conclusion i would say that uh, uh medical physics residency program once it is launched of course at the beginning it will have hiccups it will have its own set of issues uh but it will be i think something good and similarly uh, uh at the national level more and more we improve over training and education facilities so the arrival of international students will become more and more and this is i think a significant contribution under the iea uh, health scheme thank you very much and uh, that's it from my side if you have any questions i'm i'm here to answer thank you very much If anybody has any questions, comments, or queries, they can either unmute their mic and speak directly, or they can type wow. it in the chat. Wow. So we do have a comment, and this is by Rahim Gohar, and this says, "Comment: If the scope of the MS Medical Physics program was to fulfill the need of clinical medical physicists in the country, then I think we have to also focus on the strong clinical side." which you are referring as a glorified technicians application of physics in the field of medicine is called medical physics if that scientist does not know how to implement his skills a kind of technician that there is no benefit of spending that much resources for research purpose i do agree what you are saying but we need to look for the current needs of the country okay uh, uh, thank you very much for that comment i actually that comment is a uh... Uh, not to belittle the uh, technical side look once the students have done the ms program uh, we do tell them that for another year you have to undergo rigorous training to complete your skill set that is important uh, but my point of view is this that for example if i have a medical physicist working in the hospital and he does not know about basic biostatistics or if we give him a new study and he cannot infer basic information from that so i'm not doubting his skill of uh, treatment planning his skill of dosimetry they are equally important but at times you will see that uh, l- let me take give you an example for example in mammography most of the tests will be d- done by the vendor some of them will be done by the technician 
Now, if these uh, medical physicists cannot perform an MTF or something modulation transfer function, so for that he needs a theoretical foundation. So what I'm trying to say is that an MS program requires a certain amount of rigor in different subjects because it is an MS program. It is not an uh, attachment or clinical residency program. And once this product is out, yes, it is half-baked. And it is the responsibility of the hospital where they are placed that whatever rem remainder of the skills are left, they should be uh, complemented so that it becomes a complete bond. And this is something that when you will grow abroad, this discussion is happening a lot. Uh, you will hear this word that we are becoming glorified technicians and we need to revert back to our clinical sciences as well. Otherwise, we will be wiped out from the uh, hospital scene by automation or others will take over uh, our jobs. So it is the, the context is this, because for a for, for academic program, this is one of the things and we have to keep on balancing. Okay, thank you. So we have another question and this is by AQJ from AKUH. How do you see PAEC and private partnership in residency program, e.g. forming NSC and NPC? Yes, I think uh, the uh, uh, because the proposal is, st is still, I mean, um, uh, under work uh, and principal agreement has been reached. So in the NSC National Steering Committee, there is definitely uh, the participation of private sector. We have recommended that. Uh, and similarly, in the uh, uh, national project coordination, it will be on rotation basis. What we have suggested is that initially someone takes it up, then there will be three, four years period. I have not gone into those details, but in no way it is a PAC only initiative. If it had been a PAC only initiative, then PNRA would not have been involved in such lengths. Rather, we asked PNRA to be the national responsible authority and take up and form this medical physics certification board, include people according to this uh, qualification. So uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, there will be a full participation uh, from all uh, hospitals. And uh, by the way, we have carried out an initial survey, father figuring survey, that what type of hospitals and those people who have got maybe more than 15 or 20 years experience in the clinic, they will be certified directly because uh, to begin with, we need to have certified clinical medical phases, which we don't have because there was no residency program in the country. So uh, in each country, what they have done is they, they call it, and IEA calls it father figuring, that those people who have enough experience qualification, so they are certified by their new board or new body, and then they enroll the students. So I see a very strong collaboration and essential cooperation between PAC and private sector. So we have another question, and this is to be a medical physicist after completing MSc in physics, MSc in medical physics is necessary, am I right? Yeah, this question by Aisha, in principle, yes. Now, now it is the requirement. Uh, Pakistani legislation can still give you a bit of leverage, but I think with the passage of time, PNRA will take away that leverage. It is going in that direction. Uh, so now, almost after 2012, you need to have an MS degree and you need to have a, a clinical residency program if you want to work in, uh, in, in the clinic, if you want to be treating patients. If you, there are other avenues where probably a master's degree or a PhD degree will be sufficient uh, where you are working in non-hospital related jobs. So, yes. Now I think an MS is an MS is a very good platform to really launch you in the medical physics arena. I will give you an example. We get students in PhD medical physics who are interested in PhD medical physics. But to be honest, if you don't have a basic idea of the core courses, so it, it becomes very difficult for them to do good research in, uh, in medical physics. 
So yes, the answer is yes. I think we don't have any questions or comments. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your presentation.